An end of half, double digit swing, swung Kansas City, Miami. Defenses have to get back to flipping the ball more. That is just gold. A goal line that was an electrified fence. The Cowboys couldn't cross, decided Philadelphia, Dallas. And the entire AFC North in the playoffs right now. Scary, dangerous Ravens and Bengals and Browns. The Steelers also play in the AFC North. Let's go around the horn. Where's Kalashaw on the show today to defend those Cowboys? Oh, he called it a clap. Did you read him? No, he wasn't happy with the way they, they finished that game. Because he thinks of Dallas as title town now, so. We'll get to that in a second. Bengals 24, Bills 18. Has Cincy in and Buffalo out at the playoff picture midpoint of the season. Bengals, neither blood nor calf nor sky is falling for the panelists who said their season was over two weeks in. Can stop them right now. Four straight wins. Meanwhile, the Cleveland Browns, their defense, defense eats every week, shutting out Arizona. Meanwhile, meanwhile, Ari uh, the Baltimore Ravens, a four-game win streak of their own, manhandling Seattle with their hands of man. 37-3, the beat down there. So, Bill Barnwell, around the horn to you. Who's the best and scariest AFC North team right now? Scariest team in the AFC North is the scariest team in the National Football yeah. League, and that is the Baltimore Ravens, a team that is blowing out the competition, highest margin of victory of any team in football, blown out three likely playoff teams in the Browns, the Lions, and the Seahawks yesterday, also beat the team that we're hyping up as suddenly the best team in the AFC North, the Cincinnati Bengals, in week two. The Bengals have been blown out multiple times this season. When the Ravens have lost, it's been frankly because they got in their own way and made their own mistakes. They lost to the Colts mm -hmm. and lost to the Steelers in games where they played too sloppy. They have a weakness. They can beat themselves. But so far this year, I have not seen a team that's looked capable of manhandling the Baltimore Ravens, the scariest team in the National Football League. Mm, Kevin Clark, did Bill convince you Baltimore is the, the best team in the division and the league? It is right now Baltimore, but it's going to be the Cincinnati Bengals. We're going to see the final form of Joe Burrow. The last four weeks, they have doubled their offensive output from the four weeks prior. Uh, the completion percentage and touchdowns over the past four games from Burrow was unmatched since Peyton Manning a decade ago. He's spreading the ball around. He wasn't doing that a couple of weeks ago. T. Higgins is involved. The tight ends are involved. We're going to see the Joe Burrow offense, which was a real question mark just a month ago. We're going to see it, and they're going to be the best team in the AFC. All right, so that, that was a predictive statement. Best team today, Baltimore. Best team in the end will be Cincinnati, says Clark. Harry Lyles, how do you see it? I think, it's, I think it's Baltimore. I want to say Cincinnati so bad, right? Because not only is Joe Burrow performing the way that we know him to perform, but the swagger is there too, right? Pointing forward after first downs, mm -hmm. things like that. But I've got to go with Baltimore and Lamar Jackson and his team because they look complete. Bill mentioned the point margin. It's the biggest in the NFL. Five touchdowns bigger than the next team, which is the Buffalo Bills. They are 70, they're outscoring, excuse me, two of the best teams in the NFC, the two of the last three weeks in the Seahawks and the Lions, 75 to nine. That is a big deal to me because again, this is sort of a recency bias pick. So I am going to go with the team that has been better. And with the Ravens since the Super Bowl era, this is the longest streak of going into the fourth quarter with a lead that we've seen. So this is a team mm. that is constantly playing ahead. Again, uh, yes, they do have two losses that were not great, but they were at the hands of themselves. I think this is a team that has only gotten better as the year has gone along, and you're going to continue to that's, see that. That's the second time I heard that. They, they beat themselves, so that's a good thing. Okay, maybe, maybe not. George Sedano, to you on who is the best team in this best division in football. Tony, by the way, a heady play by Kevin Clark calling his shot for February now like you won't remember what actually happened back in October. <laughs> I, I never forget. How that unfolds. Uh, but nonetheless, it is the Baltimore Ravens. The Bengals are playing great, particularly because their defense is also playing great, only allowing an average of 17 points the last four weeks. But the Ravens from beginning to end have been the best team. They've only allowed nine touchdowns on defense this season in nine games, Tony. That's 105 possessions. 8.7% of possessions only end in touchdowns against the Ravens defense. The only team to do better than that? 
the 2000 Ravens. So this team is got their identity on defense, on offense. They rush for over 250 again this uh, this this particular week, and they've done that now 11 times with Lamar Jackson at the helm, which means they've got their identity on offense. They're going to bully you, and that's how they're going to win. Bill Barnwell, back in. George invoked the Tony Siragusa rule. If you can compare your team to Tony Siragusa's team, you're doing something right. Kevin Clark, I'll give you the last word, though. You believe Cincinnati is rounding into a form here, specifically in what they did to Buffalo yesterday. Joe Burrow is a feel player. He's like a golfer. He needs to get into his groove with the swing. And once we see that feel coming to fruition, and we're seeing it right now, he gets hot. Nobody is better when they're hot than Joe Burrow. You saw that in the last possession, right? Buffalo just scored to make it a one-possession game where they get the ball back. What's going to happen? Is Cincinnati going to try to run it into the line, eat up some time? Nope. Throw it downfield, pick up big yardage, and clock out the game like that. All right, we've been horn. We'll move on. How the Eagles beat the Cowboys. Cowboys could not cross the line on the Eagles. This was bonkers. How many chances did Dallas have? They had all the chances. We're talking they had chances and missed because of inches. They had chances and missed because of penalties. Philadelphia had a ton of penalties and nearly a back-breaking turnover, so they tried to give it away a little bit. That first and five play from the six went sideways. Tim Kalashuk called this a Dallas collapse, but Cowboys players suggested they were some positives to take away from the game. Kevin Clark, how do you see it? Good news is that they said it was all in the details. Everybody in the locker room, always in details. The bad news is the person in charge of details in Dallas is Mike McCarthy, who is never getting the details right. He's never getting the end of game scenarios correct. There's a reason that the Eagles are elite and the Cowboys are uh -oh. not. Uh-oh, whoa. The second consecutive <laughs> season. Oh, no, I know I'm banned. Rookie year. For the this second consecutive season. Yeah. They're 8-1. and one. And that nobody has been eight and one for two straight seasons since the 2006 Colts with Peyton Manning. Another Peyton Manning comp. But that's what we're seeing here: the difference between good and great. The Cowboys are not going to get there as presently constructed. Sweat is now tied with Parsons for uh, most pressures in the NFL right now. This is an amazing roster with an amazing coach who, who makes a lot of good decisions, and the Cowboys just don't have those kind of details. Mm. Kevin, would you say the Cowboys beat themselves yesterday? Then. Uh, I, not as much as the Ravens did in their in their I know, losses, but if, right? if, if, if you would say that, then, there. Bill, you must have loved this game from Dallas's perspective, right? They beat themselves. That's a good thing. That's what I heard last time. <laughs> Go ahead, Bill. I haven't even said anything yet, and I'm being downgraded here. This was the Cowboys' chance. They could have won this game. Yep. The Eagles were not playing well in the fourth quarter. They tried three three and outs, almost turned the ball over. Oof. Jalen Hurts is at 100% in the fourth quarter. The window was open. They could finally beat Jalen Hurts in a meaningful game, and they could not execute. They came up a half yard short on fourth and goal. They took penalties and sacks in key moments. Dak Prescott had a great game plan all game. Go after the linebackers. Go after the safeties. Mm -hmm. Go after the slot corners. Fourth down, Jake Ferguson streaking wide open. He decides to throw a curl to his fourth best receiver against James Bradbury, one of the best cornerbacks in football. The Cowboys had them on the ropes. They just could not execute when it mattered most. So Kevin is absolutely correct. This is not a, a, a bad okay. game. It's not a bad omen. This is a consistent trend for the Cowboys year after year, and this is their best chance to beat the Eagles. Gord Sedano. Tony, I know it's easy to make the Cowboys the punching bag, and we've all done it here. And, you know, far be it from me, who's been very critical of Dak Prescott, to give them any praise, but I'm with them on this. They were mere inches away from taking the lead okay. in that game yeah. because of Dak Prescott stepping out of bounds. Like, this is not a team that's that far away from Philadelphia. Philadelphia is in my opinion, the best team in the NFC. But I think Dallas showed that they're ready to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with them, and they did it on the road. Again, mere inches away, Tone. So I, I know that everyone loves to bag on the Cowboys. I'm not going to do it today. I'm going to tell you I thought they were right, they were right so there to take the lead. So you agree with what right there to we win showed it. you the quotes from some of the players saying this was an optimistic yeah, result. Even 100% though they did, with them. They didn't get the win. And Harry Lyles Jr., how do you see it? I, I, that is a positive, but also the reason you lost the game is because of execution that was within your control. Like, those two inches are not the only reason that you lost this football game. This is not a matter of being unlucky. 
This is a matter of you not executing when you need to execute. I've been saying all season, the Cowboys are good. We've seen the bright spots of them and how great this team could be. They could be in the Super Bowl if they wanted to be, but the problem is they don't execute, and that is the difference between the good and the great teams because the great team on the field that day was the Eagles, and the Eagles have not been playing their best football, and it hasn't mattered this year because they execute when you need them to execute late Did they in the know? They, they ran into, into each one. other and fumbled a ball that nearly broke their back on their last possession there. You know, Kevin, you said something while we were playing making the band phrase here that Philadelphia starts the year 8-1 and one for the second year in a row. And once again, that hasn't been happening in the NFL in 15 years. They're on the bye now, and maybe Jalen Hurts, who's looked like he's lost a little burst this season, can rest up an injured leg. We'll take a horn and move to the next topic, another game that was the separation, the striations between the top tier and maybe the tier below. Kansas City 21, Dolphins 14. Two plays. Play at the end of the half. KC stripping Tyreek Hill and the lateral for the touchdown. That's a 10 or 14 point swig. And that final miss in the last minute, third down, that Tua called a miscommunication. That's what the side of this game and did in Miami. George, you come away thinking Kansas City's the better team. Miami has got some flaws. KC's got some flaws. What did you see? Tony, I'm not worried about Kansas City. They're just doing it differently right now. They're running the ball and playing defense, and then they have they mix in the Mahomes magic. But with the Dolphins, I've been watching this team for nearly 40 years, Tony, and those last two plays encapsulate my entire life watching the Miami Dolphins. Mm. A pass that was completely short, uh, you know, that, that was miscommunication with the receiver, and then a fumbled snap with a terrible snap to the quarterback. That has been basically every big Dolphin game for the last 40 right. years of my existence. And this team could have been, or was thought to be maybe, the one that was going to break through and beat a good team. Did not happen, Bill Barnwell. Do you view this from Miami's perspective or Kansas City's? I'm concerned about it from the Chiefs' perspective. I know their defense played great football. They've been great all year. But this offense needs to have a counterpunch. Travis Kelsey did nothing in this game, maybe because Taylor Swift wasn't there. We can't say for sure. But Travis Kelsey did not play a big role in this game. And so the Chiefs scored 14 points on offense against the Dolphins' defense. That's good, but not exactly a superstar caliber defense. We need to see them have a plan B, whether it's going to be more Isaiah Pacheco in short yardage, whether it's Jared McKinnon in the passing game. They need something that's not relying on Travis Kevin Kelsey. Clark, give me the takeaway from Germany. I disagree with Bill Barnwell entirely. The fact that the Chiefs have, A, a great defense, and B, the youngest defense in football by snap-adjusted uh, age is really significant. For the next five years, from a team winning perspective, that's huge. They will figure out the offensive side of the ball. Mahomes said it. They will figure out the receiving thing, Kelsey on option routes, finding holes in the zones. That'll work. I'm more concerned with the Dolphins coming out of this. They're now 0-3 against teams with winning records. Mm. They averaged 22 points more per game against teams that were 500 or worse. They've got a good team problem, and they got to figure it out. I think if you're the Chiefs, you want to see them continue to develop Rasheed Rice because as long as you've got 15 back there playing quarterback, I think you're going to be okay. But to me, the thing with the Dolphins is you want to see that offense begin to travel. They're 4-0 and averaging 44 points per game at home. Two for two at win two and three, excuse me, and averaging just 22 points on the road. So you got to see that offense travel. We've been warm. We'll take a break right here. Although there was something that you said, Kevin Clark. Snap adjusted age. Snap, adjusted age. It's Barnwell's stat. It's Barnwell's stat. Remember when stat. people were just a certain age and it wasn't? No, that's just, you're both getting muted. I'm, Let's I'm, go. Fire I'm something. being downgraded <laughs> for someone using my stat. Last minute wins in week nine. The Vikings and the Texans pulled it off within seconds of each other. Let's go around that horn. Houston got it when C.J. Stroud went perfecto. 470 yards on the day. Five touchdowns and then... The 75-yard drive to finish it off, he did it in 45 seconds. A thing of beauty for anybody for it to come and start number eight. No vegetables, all ice in his veins, his teammates say. I'm not sure if that's advisable. Kevin, what are you buying as the most impressive part of Stroud's game? 
He's making the Texans' plan make sense, frankly. Everybody was questioning why the Texans would accelerate the timeline, trade their first-round pick. Well, it makes sense now. I'd rather have C.J. Stroud than any of the top two quarterbacks coming into the draft next year. Uh, six of eight for 199 yards and three touchdowns when throwing 20 yards in the air in a league where that's not supposed to happen anymore with the deep ball. This makes sense. He's changing the franchise. The Texans are here. Great coach. This all makes sense. Just to follow up, you said nobody throws deep anymore. How is he doing it then? Accuracy and finding these holes. He doesn't even have a number one receiver. He's just amazing at processing and, and like he's on Matthew Stafford level, Cam Newton level rookie production. This does not happen anymore and he's doing it. Bill Barnwell. I think what we're seeing here is a player who's transcending everything we're told about young quarterbacks. You got to give them a great running game. Well, CJ Stroud was literally being thrown the ball on option pitches as the gatherer yesterday. He wasn't <laughs> the quarterback on those plays. Receivers, you're supposed to have great receivers. He was throwing a Tank Dell and Noah Brown for more than 100 yards yesterday. He's making magic happen when you're in situations where quarterbacks are supposed to struggle. George Sedano. Mm. Tony, two things stick out. Clearly the ending, he had like less than a minute to go and he put them in the, in the position to win the freaking game. That's the most important thing. And then the other part is how he's matured over the course of the season, which is he started the season just not making the big mistakes, taking chances here and there occasionally, and now he's letting it rip as we've seen him be the number one rookie quarterback as far as yardage in a game with five touchdowns. And Harry Lyle Jr. Tony, we said the best case scenario for the Texans would be if they got the C.J. Stroud that we saw when they played the University of Georgia here in Atlanta. They have gotten that player with that confidence throughout the season. It showed up yesterday. And since ESPN has been tracking coverages starting in 2017, he literally just had one of the best passing games against zone that we've seen since 2017. Four of his five touchdowns came against the zone. That's tied for the most ever. And 367 of his yards, that was the fourth most ever. It's an incredible performance, and he's going to keep getting better. Texans had no kicker, by the way, in this game. They needed running back Daria Gumbawale to kick. So I'm going to vote him Special Teams Player of the Week. And normally that would be the best fill-in of the season. But no, that honor goes to Josh Dobbs. Buy or sell two of it's how the Vikings traded for Dobbs midweek. It's his third team since camp started. He was forced into duty mid-game because of injury, was teaching his linemen his cadence on the sideline, didn't know their names, and he had a last-minute win. Look at this. Bill, that he could do that, does that say more about Dobbs or more about the now 5-4 and four Vikings or less about the Falcons? Says more about Joshua Dobbs. This is one of the most impressive performances you will ever see. When he started last year in Tennessee, this year in Arizona, he knew he was starting heading into Sunday. This week, he did not know. Jaron Hall was the starter. He came in in the first quarter after Hall got concussed. Incredible performance from Joshua Dobbs. He should have an NFL job until he's 50 years old after what he did on Sunday. George Dada. Tony, as the old guy on this panel who also may not know everybody's names here, I will tell you that two <laughs> names come to mind immediately. Steve DeBerg and Vince Evans, guys who played into their 40s because they were so malleable. They could play anywhere, anytime, regardless of circumstance. And you talk to the people in Arizona this year, they will tell you they were in games because of Josh Dobbs, including a win against the Cowboys earlier this year. Aaron Lyles Jr. I think it would be easy for me to give you the Atlanta Falcons side of this thing, which is Arthur Blank said before the season, this is a three-year plan and they're in the third year of it and it does not look good halfway through. However, mm -hmm. I texted Josh Dobbs' quarterback coach earlier today, Quincy Avery, and I asked him, hey, what went into this? And he said he did one extra walkthrough and he said his memory is absolutely incredible. So while he only took a couple of looks at that play sheet, he knew what was on it and executed it and it worked out for them. Talked about the Falcons, Arthur Smith shaved off his mustache today, so maybe that'll turn the team around. And, oh. and Kevin Clark, how about you? Bill is correct in that Josh Dobbs should have a job for life, but it should be as an all-time emergency quarterback. Auction off your services every single week to a team that needs this. Show up on Tuesday, win a game on Sunday. This was incredible. He broke the record basically for back-to-back -back production by quarterback for two different teams in two different weeks. Who is this competition? This doesn't ever. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask you. I, whose record did he break? I, I can't. How many times do you see a guy play for one team one week and then the next team the next week? And his turnaround was even quicker than unbelievable. You know what his major was in college? Anybody? I mean, this is an impossible question. The rocket science. Rocket science, exactly. Rocket science. Now you, now it all comes together. If you, I mean, if you'd be able to pull off a win over the Falcons, it'd be a lot easier landing the spaceship. That's it for Sedano and Lyles, Clark and Barnwell. Showdown.
Next, the Bill Simmons coaching tree. Bill Barnwell, good luck in showdown. Caleb Williams, something I never understand. People want passion, but then when people show passion, they say too much passion. The hot takes on him after he was being consoled by his family after a loss and knocked USC out of the top 25 were ludicrous. Let the young player be a young player. We'll move on. Last bedlam and putting the lambs to bed. OK State winning. They threw their goalposts in the pond. That's been a theme this year. Clemson over the Irish. Eat it, Tyler from Spartanburg. And Alabama rolling LSU. And we're just hurling once again to an Alabama-Georgia SEC title game. Kevin, the big college takeaway. Uh, it's USC, but it's Lincoln Riley finally firing defensive coordinator Alex Grinch two years too late. They wasted Caleb Williams there in L.A. Mm. for two years. The 124th in defensive scoring. This was a disaster too late. Bill? Yeah, it's got to be the goalpost going into another lake around the country. We talk about this every Monday. As a person who's going to a school with no lake on campus, every school. I think this a is a pond. I believe this is a, You know the name of the pond? I'll give you the face time if you know the name of the pond for Oklahoma State. Was it Lake Pond? <laughs> <laughs> Points to Kevin Clark. All right, there was some criticism over the weekend about the Las Vegas Raiders smoking cigars after beating Tommy DeVito and the Giants. Here's the situation. The Raiders scored more points in the first half yesterday than they did with Josh McDaniels in any game this season. Don't ever criticize celebrating getting rid of a bad boss. There were good vibes. The bad boss is gone. The Antonio Pierce era will be special. Thank you for that, Kevin Clark. Fade upon a tranquil spot on the campus. We'll see you tomorrow.